Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. And thank you for joining us today. Our very special guest joining us now is Brandon Steiner. He is the founder and president of the Steiner Agency and Collectible Exchange. Guys, please welcome Mr. Steiner to the show. Brandon, how are you doing today? I'm good, Jill. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You know, so much going on in the world of business. I, I, I just can't believe the disruption, the changes, the excitement. Uh, the ups, the downs. I mean, it's a little bit all over the place. Hopefully we can cover it in the next 30 minutes, but <laughs> I, I hope I, I can know. give a little bit. You, you're a legend with all you've done with your career back to the Flatbush Brooklyn days. Woohoo! My family's from Queens. Uh, you know, you're a New Yorker, true to heart, Scarsdale. I'm a Long Island gal, uh, but uh, you know, New York is true to your heart. The sports are true to your heart and you've accomplished so much and are like one of the most influential people. So it's exciting to have you here on the show. I'm excited and honored to interview you. And I'm really excited to talk about your new ventures and everything you're doing. So if you don't mind, um, can I just ask you personally, a little about the sports world and how you got involved. I mean, you've been an incredible salesman for all these years. What was it about this business and this field and love of sports in a sense that drove you here? Well, actually the unknown. I mean, when I got into this thing in the eighties, it really wasn't much of a business. It wasn't an industry. It was obviously something I was passionate about, but you talk to a million people that are passionate about sports, but I was always an entrepreneur first and then the sports thing second. Uh, making money, hustling, trying to think about things differently. It was always uh, my first, my first love. And I saw that in the sports business where it was really just starting to evolve in the eighties and not much was being done with the players. And I was working at the hard rock and a lot of, in the first hard rock, by the way, in 1984 was a really popular place. You got to know people to get in. So running the place at night. As, now, was as it the I same did. location it is today in the city in Times no. Square? It was a different location, but it wasn't the no, same. No, no, no. It was on 57th Street. Okay. Um, and, and had the Cadillac sticking out. And, and everything, <laughs> you know, I, I was really in learning mode. I, I think you can't be enough of a learner to be an earner. And I think like even back then I was in the hottest spot. And obviously I got to Syracuse, graduated and, and worked a lot of years in the kitchen. Got my okay. training at Hyatt. But even when at the Hard Rock, I, I said to Isaac Tiger, the owner, why 57th Street? He goes, because that's one of the more richer, more low-key neighborhoods. And so his idea was, and the same thing we did with the Hard Rock in London at Hyde Park. He went into a really upscale neighborhood and put a down and dirty kind of theme restaurant. Mm -hmm. Because his thinking is, he goes, you know, rich people like to get down and dirty like burgers do. Yeah. That's the misconception. Like you think you'd go to a rich neighborhood, you got to have like a four-star restaurant. But, you know, rich people like to get, you know, eggs and, and cheesecake and burgers, you know. sliders, French fries. So it was brilliant. So he goes to like one of the most expensive streets in New York, 57th Street, opens up the Hard Rock. And I, I don't know, for me, like it, there was a lot of partying, you know, 300 people online from two in the afternoon to really two in the morning it was really one of the most challenging management jobs I probably have ever had. It was my breakthrough which is why I take a few minutes to talk about it. You don't know where your breakthrough is going to come through. I was about to get out of the restaurant business. I take the hard rock gig. Everybody's fawning over the rock and roll stars, Rod Stewart, Elton John, rightfully so. But I was a big sports nut. So when the athletes yeah. came in, I was the only one who gave them any attention <laughs> and got their names, numbers, you know, contacts, started hanging out with them. And that's how I got into the sports business. Yeah. Fantastic. So from there, though, then you launched your own line of uh, restaurant bars, correct? Well, I, I got into the sports bar business because at the Hard Rock, I was thinking, wow, it'd be really cool to have a, a concept like this. But in sports, it really pissed mm -hmm. me off. <laughs> the owner wouldn't put a TV in there. And I worked at night oh. and it drove me crazy. I said, imagine if you had all this memorabilia on the wall in the same kind of environment, but a sports theme. So I, you know, I was only 24 at the time. So it was a little ahead of my time to come up with a theme like that and capitalize on it. But I, I did capitalize on the relationships and contacts I had. I don't think you ever can meet enough people. That's like my son's quote. And it's true. You can't meet enough people. You can't get up and make enough contacts. And uh, that's exactly what I did at, you know, at the sporting club, which was downtown. Yeah. It was in the middle of nowhere when before Tribeca was Tribeca. Tribeca. Yeah. I literally went from a 2000, 2000 covers a day restaurant and then some. To my first night at the sporting club, we did one cover. The second night, zero. The only reason we did the one cover is because I coerced somebody from outside to come in. I offered to buy him a drink and he 
settled in and bought dinner. I mean, so it was really humbling. It's, it's, it's amazing how fast life can change on you for the good and the bad or the unknown. And I've always been somebody who likes to jump into the unknown, which is yeah. what I'm doing now. And, and like you said, you say, the, be the underdog, right? Yeah, there's no question. You don't <laughs> want to be the favorite. The underdog, you got everything to win. Yeah. Nothing to lose. When you're the favorite, it's you seem like you're just not in the right spot. Um, and most people thought I was had a drug problem when I left the Hard Rock to go to the sporting club because it was the hottest place on the planet. Like, and here I am going to a place in the middle of nowhere. And also, you know, now we used to go to sports bars and TVs. Back then, there was no, there was only two sports bars in the country. Wow. Literally. So it wasn't like people would go have dinner, restaurant, and watch games. That was not, you know, no satellites. There was very uh -huh. little cable. But I had the, I had, you know, I always think that if you want to be a leader, you got to be a pathfinder. To be a pathfinder, the definition is, is to seek ahead, go ahead of other people to help them find your way. And I think that's kind of what I've enjoyed doing in my career is I don't mind jumping ahead of the pack, figuring it out, finding my way so that people can follow. Now, then you started Steiner Sports and boy, oh boy, did that grow. Unbelievable. The work you did, the partnerships you made and what you've accomplished with that. So congratulations on what you did. And I know you sold the company. You have a whole nother company we're going to talk about too, but would you mind sharing your thoughts about, um, how you, you encompass all you did. I mean, look behind you, look at that wall, all those autographs and well, working, that's networking, line, that's networking. A women, that's, that's a new line of women product we're creating because women haven't gotten the love and respect, the women athletes. Mm -hmm. So I've decided time's up and it's time to give women collectibles right. and women licensing it's due because there's some extraordinary women out there. So my new company, Athlete Direct, we have a whole line of women collectibles paying homage to some of the greats, young and old, and the women have been amazing to work with. I think getting back to Steiner, just to close that out is, mm -hmm. you know, I started that company with 4,000 bucks. I bought a Mac Plus and a printer that was 3,500 at 500 left. I don't recommend that for those of you at home that are listening. It's not really a smart idea. Um, it, it was a real, it was a real challenge. Real risk. I look back <laughs> on it. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to start a company with 4,000 bucks. I started the collectible company with 10,000 which is way, way undercapitalized. And, you know, I got a little lucky. I was a relentless worker. And again, I was going at the business in a way that had never been done before. And, you know, I got built up to a nice, you know, $50 million company. So I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful for the fans. When yeah. it's all said and done, when I left Steiner and, you know, we had, you know, hundreds, I've secured over 30 million autographs and way over almost, you know, I think over almost 25,000 appearances. I mean, we're known to book talent, move town over the country. I was booking two, 3,000 appearances a year myself with, a, with an intern. But I think when I look back at that company, I, you know, I, I think about the customers, the, the loyalty that, that people gave to me to stick with me for 35 years, buying what I was yeah. dreaming up and creating is probably my biggest, you know, the, 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 the fanfare and the customers that I was able to bring closer to the game. That was always my goal as a kid. Like, how do I get on the field, man? How do I wear those cleats that those players are wearing? So finally I did. And yeah. when I got on the field, I text all my friends, like, I'm on the field, man. I'm not getting arrested either. And I'm getting the cleats and I'm getting the bat. And I'm, and gonna I'm getting it. pictures and I'm going to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, Steiner, Steiner was great. It was, yeah. it was different. It was a unique company that, um, you know, I shared my name. It's hard to leave a company like that behind, knowing that you built it and, and had a big impact even on the industry. I when mean, I clearly, collectible, the Yankees was one of the biggest uh, well, collaborations. The Yankees, Yankees I mean, Steiner a whole changed. bunch, but yeah. Well, Yankee Steiner, Notre Dame Steiner, the Red Sox Steiner. It changed everything. It changed the way people view it as collectibles. Mm -hmm. It's hard to leave a company like that you, when you build an industry and build a business like the way I did. And because you want to disrupt it and blow it up. And, but I think that, and a good lesson I've learned is like, sometimes you got to blow up what you have in order to make room for something new. Yeah. And, and as hard as it was, and, and when I say hard, I don't want to sit here, you know, it brings you to tears. You know, I'm, I sure, cried I'm sure you and your family cried. I mean, it's gotta be a hard thing. I but, cried many mornings just on the frustration uh, of what's next and what else. And when, when I figured out what was next, which was collectible exchange, which is a much better form of eBay which is another form of like Amazon and eBay combined. Yeah. I meant that I had to leave Steiner to do really what I thought customers ultimately wanted, which is a fair place to trade and buy and sell their collectibles, that things can get authenticated, verified, 
to find out what you have and what it's worth. And then Athlete Direct is like Amazon, where you can actually go to these athletes' lockers. Right now, I think we have 85 of them growing like weeds. Uh-huh. So, and we're partners with these players. And so you can go into their lockers and buy stuff from the players directly. That's what I love about AthleteDirect.com is that there is no in-between. Yep. You got the player sneakers, their wristbands, their shirts, their jerseys. And it uh, really puts the, the fan closer to the game, closer to their talent. Collectible Exchange has over 125,000 items. Wow. Because I was sitting on my couch one night, and this is how it really started. Because <laughs> everything, everything's my wife's fault. She said I could <laughs> blame her for everything. So I'm going to do that. But I'm sitting on the couch and says, you know, honey, like, what are you going to do with all this stuff? Because we have a, a kind of a big sports room. I, I could imagine. Probably the whole house is full of sports. Does she allow it? <laughs> no, 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 okay. no. Well, she gave me a really big sports get, room. She, and, and, get your own house. <laughs> no, I, I have a lot of issues and she knows that. So she gave me enough room to put all my stuff. But, you know, she, so I said, honey, like, I mean, if I die, what are you going to do with this thing? And obviously my wife's not a big collector. And it really got me thinking about, you know, as these baby boomer generations are getting older, people are downsizing. You know, people want to sell. Maybe people want to trade in their stuff. There's no real fair platform to do that. So I was just thinking it'd be nice to have a really much more upgraded marketplace for people to buy and sell. And I was thinking about all my athlete relationships. They got a lot of stuff, too. Yeah. These guys are bringing truckloads of stuff. Like Mark Messier just brought like two truckloads of his stuff. Oh he was gosh. moving. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's amazing. These guys are bringing stuff in because they're pack rats. So we're helping the players get connected directly to the fans, which they're their own microsites. They're raising money for charity. And now the fans have a safe place to buy and sell their stuff. <laughs> and as much as I love Steiner sports, you know, I'm not Steiner. That Steiner is not Steiner without Steiner. Now Steiner is collectible exchange and athlete direct. And, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm going back to my roots, which is, you know, being a solution-based salesperson, which is got to find a problem, got to put yourself in other people's shoes. And I, when I put myself in the athlete's shoes and when I put myself in the customer's shoes, this is what I felt we needed to do. Yeah. I got to tell you, for everybody out there, don't do this. Don't go blow up your business in order to create a new one. Not a good idea, but you know, I don't care. I'm a little different and that's what I'm doing. That's what I did. Well, you took a great risk. I mean, but you were so successful. So congratulations on your success and all the relationships you've built and what you've built. What a model and inspiration. And clearly with all the athletes, the fans, um, you're still rocking it today. So we're talking about networking on the highest level. We're talking about influence the influences. Let's talk more about the new company and how you are. You know, I saw some of the YouTube videos that you have, by the way, uh, go to brandonsteiner.com. You can find out more there about the athlete exchange. You can find out more about the, the new company, but also, um, let me ask you this, uh, you're also an author. So where did you find time to write books and all this? I mean, how is that even possible? <laughs> well, first of all, just on the networking thing, you know, I go to, I go to these events and I speak around the country and everybody's trying to, you know, obviously customer acquisitions, a very big deal. It's mm-hmm. expensive. It's hard, but it's not who, you know, what, you know, but what you know about who. Exactly. One of the things I really try to emphasize with people is before you start looking to meet more people, Get to know the ones you already know, because most of the people that we think we know, we really don't know all that well. Mm-hmm. And you'd be surprised who those people can lead you to once you get to know them a little better. Uh, and I think that's the best form of, uh, of I mean, who can go into a room not knowing anybody and start meeting people? It's really hard, let alone whether you're going to trust them or not. The best way to meet more people is through the people you already know that trust you, that know you, that can give you a good recommendation. So, you know, when I think about the books, what's funny about that is you know, I'm half illiterate, you know, I'm, I'm really not that smart. And I, I really always struggled writing and reading as a kid. Um, I barely got into college, I had to take freshman English like three times. Uh, I don't, I, you know, writing and reading was hard. And that's why I love writing the three books, because my brother every day told me how much of a moron I was. And he was an incredible writer. So the fact that I put three books out is just just, just kind of the kind of the way I operate. It's the same thing like I've had a radio show, you know, I had a TV show for 12 years, like all this stuff that people just told me I shouldn't do. But I wanted to communicate with fans and I wanted to communicate with my customers about what was what I was thinking. As the customer base got bigger, I felt like the book was kind of appropriate for me to explain how Steiner got built or what happens when you get success, when you have a little luck, what that means and the troubles I ran into. You know, Living on Purpose, my last book was a very hard book to write. 
my family is still upset with me about writing it because it, well, a lot of it was the absolute truth about the ups and downs, not all the good stuff, but, you know, some, some stuff that came with success, you know, a few things that came with uh, my drive and focus on the business that kind of left me maybe not as good a husband or father or friend as I wanted to be, and certainly not as healthy as I wanted to be. So I think that's, that last book was really an important book to me. The real book that's a killer that I love, which you, you got to have balls. That was the second book. Yeah. My, mother, <laughs> my mother's favorite line. Aww. My mother's line. You got to have balls. Be fearless. Be relentless. Don't be afraid. And don't awesome. take any shit from anyone. You know, yeah, don't. Right. Yeah. Now, the business playbook was when I got out of college and I've been working since I'm 10, couldn't get a job and I got shingles. And the arrogance, I think about when I look at it, like I was like, when I figure this job thing out, I'm going to write a book so that other kids that are going to college can prepare better to get that first job. And also yeah. a big part of, you know, oh, I always say getting a job is a job, but to build your brand should start in high school. It should start in middle school and kids are thinking, ah, I got plenty of time, but you're always building your brand. And one of the things I did do that my mother emphasized was always to build my brand reputation, even through growing up way before I even got to college. So when I got out of school and things, you know, started evolving and Steiner Sports started working, the business playbook is for every young kid in high school and college that wants to get going. These are so, what I call snackable content. These are all little nuggets that a 15, 16, 18 year old can dissolve, dissolve eat, and put Good. into play. Good. Little increments. They need baby so steps. three books, yes. 2,500 okay, so blogs. 250 pods, you know, because I had a speech impediment when I was a kid. Not that I would, I was a relatively normal kid, but I had a speech impediment and my mother would drive me crazy because I talked like this and I, I was like a truck driver. And so I go home one day and I told my mother, I said, mom, look, I'm not going to speech pathologist anymore. I'm done. I have had it. I don't need it. She says, really? No problem. Great. <laughs> Only one day did my mother ever pick me up from school. On this day, she picks me up. She says, I want to take you for a little drive. We drive. We stop behind a sanitation truck. We get out. I want to introduce you to Joe, who drives the sanitation truck. Joe, this is my son, Brandon. Um, he's interested in this profession. He one day wants to grow up and drive a sanitation truck. He mm -hmm. wants to be a sanitation engineer where he can take out the garbage. Can you give him all the benefits, the pay, what that would be like when one day when he grows up so he can eventually become a sanitation worker? I went home and said, mom, I'll go back to the pathologist. She said, well, if wow. you're going to talk like that, you're not going to go. Then you're going to end up being a truck driver or a sanitation worker. There's yeah. nothing wrong with it. Not there's nothing wrong with it. Shit. But wow. So yeah, your that was my mom... mother's way of teaching and showing you the repercussions and the reality of your decisions. Smart, smart yeah. woman. So do you credit her with your success? Oh, there's no question. You know, yeah. my mother was so, you know, first of all, I attribute all the work I do with all the women now, and I'm going to get emotional here, but I I'm so excited about, you know, what I feel like I can maybe help women do only a small part. I'm one spoke in the wheel about getting things kind of evened out and straightened out. But in the sports world, like my daughter really brought it up to me and I feel like it's a little bit of a tribute to her, but you know, my mother was a businesswoman in the sixties, auto parts, your car broke down on the phone. She'd tell you where the spark plugs, this, that change a flat. Um, you know, she was a very rare, unusual woman that kid, you know, with three kids. So, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of learning lessons that you got to have balls. It, although people think it's a sports book and it does tell the story how I built a really successful company. But it's also about how I got parented and all the lessons. Yeah. my mother taught. It could be called everything my mother taught me and I made a shitload of money from it. Uh huh. There you go. And you could do the same. Read the book, get inspired. You may not have a Mrs. Steiner like uh, Brandon, but you know what? Everyone has a Mrs. Steiner and they can live vicariously through you. Read those words, be inspired from you. And that's what you're here doing. And you're doing that today on the stage with your speaking, with your new company. And speaking of the new company, I know we talked a little bit about, but can we just go into a little more depth of what collectible exchange is and how it really works? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, you know, I'm a little older and I'm not the biggest tech head and this is more of a tech company. So we made it really easy for you to take items and put it up on the site so you can mm -hmm. turn your turn your cloth to cash. And by the way, any one of my three books is online and, and just for free. So you go to the book, pick any of the three books. We do that every December for Christmas and in January to get the year off to a good start. Pick any one of my books out. You just pay for the shipping. You got wow. For wow. That's awesome. But I, I think, I think it's about turning your cloth to cash, getting closer to the athletes was really my goal. 
and not forcing my customers to take, although they did, they put a lot of confidence. The stuff that I've created over the years, which is absurd, sane, selling dirt, bricks, broken hockey sticks, turning up to ice scrapers, you know, all the crazy stuff I did. I've sold over $50 million of dirt. But I, I, my customers have had a lot of faith in, in my vision about what they should collect. But I wanted to reverse the roles. I'm like, so this kind of does that. This puts the collectability back in the fans' hands. And I'm following their leads and I'm pushing their products. And you know what I found out is, <laughs> and I think I'm a pretty good collector. Yeah. And I've done a lot of cool collectibles, but there's some great collectible people out there that have done an amazing job with amazing projects. And I'm more excited about getting behind what they're doing to grow the business and to, you know, some little kid in Des Moines who wants to get something from some other kid in Boston can now trade safely. That's the problem. Like, I want to make sure that the, the sites are clean, manicured, secure in a way where there's the proper authentication. So when you go to Collectible Exchange, you know you have my name, my vision behind it, and I'm really making sure that things are being done the right way. So far, so good. But, you know, look, I, I can't tell you how many times I went home and told my wife mm. that we were going out of business at Steiner. You know, she'd roll her eyes. I have to get W4, W40 oil. But those yep. eyeballs were like, uh, so, like, you know, I, I go through the same trials and tribulations now. But I'm excited about this new venture. Uh, we have a okay. bunch of different platforms. Like uh, we partnered up with UFC, if you're an MMA fan, mm -hmm. or uh, the Islanders. And, and we're partnered up with a bunch of colleges. If you're into that, filling over UConn, Syracuse. So we have a bunch of cool products that we get from the schools, but we're partnered with them and we're following their lead on the different products that we're going to sell and that sort of thing. Now, you did mention the dirt. Is this the old Yankee Stadium dirt we're talking about? <laughs> it started with it started with that, but it's dirt from all the different stadiums. Awesome. It, it, it's grass from all the different stadiums that we freeze dried. It's bricks from Fenway Park and Wrigley Field. It's And it's just putting that stuff to good use and being creative. I know it sounds kind of foolish, but, you know, dirt from Yankee Stadium, the, the dirt like that Lou Garrett, epic. Babe Ruth, Jeter, Mariano stepped on that dirt. They've all touched it. it. And the reason I thought of that is, you know, just empathy. I like put myself in someone else's shoes. As soon as the Literally. first time I got on the field, Shoes on the, like, on the what dirt, I do? Yeah. Grab some dirt, put it in my pocket. Good luck. So uh, that's kind of how that worked out. But it worked out pretty good. The margins on that dirt, by the way, are pretty good. Yeah. So it was, a good, it was a good thing to sell. I awesome. Like and let me ask you, anything else stands out in particular? I mean, there's so much memorabilia over the years, but anything else that really stands out to you that? I think taking down the stadiums has always been, a, uh, you know, kind of a try. It's just the good, the bad, the ugly. You know, when you knock down a Yankee stadium and sell it all piece by piece, which yeah. is completely different than anyone else wanted to do. Or MetLife, it took Texas Stadium down the garden, Madison Square Garden, one of those famous arenas. I really have enjoyed doing that because it's it shows the respect. You know, we all spend a lot of time in these arenas and these are the great moments of our life, kind of similar to church and a chapel. Not to compare it, but, it, it, you know, the same no. kind of feeling. And that energy lives there down, and it's like the energy goes, but and then there's a whole new era and a whole new, like, look what the Islanders are now at the new arena. It's like... Then they went to Barclays, and <laughs> I mean, I see. I took Nassau Coliseum down too, by the way. You did, and, and, yeah. Awesome. But see, you I, know, like I feel like these buildings deserve the respect. Yep. Mm -hmm. People put a lot of their love and time and energy into these buildings, into the fandom of it all, and I want to make sure that stuff gets dissected. Yeah. And you have a piece to remember all those that first time you took your kids, or that game when they had the overtime goal, the game-winning shot, the home run. Like, I love capturing all those memories. You know, memorabilia is memories. You know, it's memorabilia, and it's collecting those memories in a crazy world where things can get you up and down. You got the memories of the good stuff that's happened, and that's yeah. my job, keep creating that stuff and mm -hmm. delivering it to fans. So I'm very grateful. You know, I mean, what a run, and, and to keep, be able to keep doing it, and people are still interested in what I'm trying to create and do is very uh, – it's moving, and it's appreciated greatly. Awesome. Yeah, I used to work at the Coliseum for the New York Islanders, and as ancient as it was, it was hard to see it go down. It was hard to say goodbye to that place. I mean, the it barn. needed it. Yeah, it needed some help. But my goodness, my goodness. All right. So also, let's just continue. We have just a few minutes left in the show, Brandon. Uh, what else do you want to share about your new company? And, you know, 
what are the roles you see yourself in the future? I mean, you're doing a lot. Is this well, it or is there going to be something else? <laughs> I've always been, I've always been a, a busy, I keep busy, but I think the most important thing is, you know, how you can help and, and make a difference uh, with people. So, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of mentoring and a lot of coaching mm-hmm. where I can, trying to get to some schools with young entrepreneurs and give them a little bit of the way of what entrepreneurship is about. So they don't have these delusional views that, you know, they're going to all of a sudden snap their fingers and make a gazillion dollars. Um, and that's a big part of everything that I'm doing at Collectible Exchange is, is trying to do some good, helping athletes raise a lot of money for their charities. A big part of our athletes direct a lot of the charity, the money goes to charity. And that's a that's kind of, you know, at this point, you know, it's always good to make a few bucks, but it's Giving much back. better to help others. You know, it's just, it, it's just much better, you know, to be able to make an impact on, especially some of the athletes that have all these assets and convert them into a push to a charity or initiative yeah. is is a blessing. Great. And is there any other new uh, business ventures on the way that you want to share? Um, you know, between the, the speaking <laughs> around the country. How do you have time? <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I've been, I've been pretty busy. I, I, and, you know, I've been making, you know, it's funny, like, you know, my one bit of advice for anybody listening is like, stop rushing. Okay. Like, I refuse to rush anymore. Like, I used to take a private plane and this, that. Like, why? Why? You, you, when you rush, doesn't mean you're doing more. And it certainly doesn't mean you're doing it better. Dressing you out. Stop rushing. Because no one's ever rushed and done an incredible job with something they rushed through. And it isn't the goal to do something incredible. And one of the things I've taken the time, particularly with Collectible Exchange and Athlete Direct, is not to rush. Because I want it to be great. I want it to be a game change. I want it to be different for fans and have a real marketplace for them to use. And if I rush through it, it's not going to be my best work. Yeah. And I tell, I tell everybody listening is like, stop rushing through things. Doesn't nobody ever rushed through something and got better or rushed through it and we got the best result. But yet we all seem to be rushing a lot lately. And yeah. I tell everybody not to slow down, but to pause a little bit and don't rush. Well, you know what I must say is a heart of a year and a half, almost two years now it's been with this pandemic. It, it did, I think, make a lot of us put things into perspective and slow down. And take a little bit of a mental break to value what's really important, our family, those around us, the value of life. And I think as a society, we did slow down a little, but now we're, you know, especially us New Yorkers, right? It's hustling and bustling again, the big apple and all that. But um, I think I think it changed a lot of us for the good. And um, I hope. That, you know, the one thing I take that's good out of that was that it taught me. I have a four and six year old and, you know, I'm a work, 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 work. You time, got your hands full. time to, you know what, focus on what's really important. God gives us or whatever it is you believe in out there. Um, you get one life, you know, value it and enjoy it and look at those things that are most important. Look, work is great. Making money is great. But I'm sure you would say it's not the best thing in the world. It's your family. It's right? pretty good, though. Making money is pretty good. good. It's it is good. really good. And, and it, it should, it should be pretty good, but it's just not everything. And yeah, exactly. But what's also important is that, you know, through great change and adversity comes great opportunity and responsibility. And I think that this virus really, you know, it really has presented a tremendous amount of opportunity. The changes that have gone on have it's entrepreneurship through the roof. Yeah. I really have to hold myself and strap myself in. <laughs> to not want to jump into a million things because there's so much change and need. When you see the change, you're able to see different people going through different things and the things that they emotionally or physically need. Mm-hmm. Your instinct is to want to deliver want that. To That's to, what yeah. being an entrepreneur is about. And so I think that it's been a little bit of, it's been a really a lot of bit of a tough couple of years, but there's around the corner is, I mean, a rainbow that's got a huge, bundle of opportunities if you have some entrepreneur spirit that you want to ignite and kick off and if you need brandon to speak at one of your events hello go to the website brandonsteiner.com a very inspirational on that stage uh talking about his own story and just doing what you do and what you know best thanks to mom but really (laughs) brandon so we're gonna wrap it up today and we want to i just want to thank you for being here for doing this interview with us thanks to your mom for making you and for inspiring you and doing all you do for all these people out there, you know, especially the children who look up to those athletes and want a piece of something of them and feel right. I mean, nothing more precious than a look of a child when he gets uh, that football that so-and-so held or that it's just it's nothing. Everything. Yep. Yep. All right, Brandon, tell us how we can contact you. Thank you. Um, well, collectible exchange. If you want to get one of my books, 
I'm a big LinkedIn guy, even though I'm over the limit. I still don't understand why there's a limit, but but yeah, follow me because I'm, I message everybody back it's and awesome. I post a lot of really good content on LinkedIn. It's my Facebook, same thing. Do a lot of Facebook lives. If you're a sports fan, you interview a lot of players on live on Facebook. That's kind of my thing. And, uh, you know, if you want to find out about the speaking and stuff, brandonsteiner.com. But I say go to Collectible Exchange, get a copy of my book and don't read it either. Study it because the books, especially the last book, is, is if you actually take the time to read, it, it'll be a game changer. Awesome. Thank you again. And did you really say free during this month of December and January? Just yes. pay for the shipping. Do you hear that, guys? Free. Brandon Steiner, go to the website, check them out, Google them. You'll find the books there, too. And thank you for taking the time with us today. Best of luck during this holiday season and a happiest new year as well, Brandon. Hopefully I'll see you in person one day soon, okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Have, stay safe. Thank you. You too, sweetheart. Have a great day. And to all of our all right. viewers and listeners, stay tuned. More of the show is on the way. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's, it's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage-free, fully adaptive, handicap-accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's going to be okay.